Gmail.com. It's Sunday morning, and every decent man and woman is listening to Test Miles with Nick Miles on FM News 101 KXL. Buckle in. Pow! Super Bowl Sunday. Time to chill cars for the next 60 minutes on your weekly automotive radio experience. I'm Nick Miles, and you're listening to America's automotive radio show, Test Miles, on radio, on television, online, and on mobile, locally created and nationally celebrated. What's on today's show? Well, we've been test driving some cars from the Test Miles garage. We'll tell you all about those. We're also going to find out about how Cadillac is shaking things up. Bill Mack from Cadillac, the global project manager, is going to give us the inside scoop on the new car, the CT6. Uh, and Andy Colley from um, AT&T, he's the director of communications. Uh, they're going to shake things up as far as connecting your car is concerned. We've got some testing of product, and Jeff Zerschmied is going to be here to tell us all about the Nissan Sentra and also some ice driving that we both did together last week in uh, Colorado. What have I been driving this week? I have been in a car which I am gloriously happy about. It's the new Mini Clubman, the 2016 uh, the Clubman, of course, they like to call it the estate car of the car family. It's uh, Most Americans would know it as a wagon. It's the wagon version, now so much bigger. It's the size of a RAV4, and that's what it, one of the cars it competes with. Uh, it has four additional inches on the axle and uh, makes the longest Mini to date, uh, 47.9 cubic feet of cargo space. Some cool things inside, refrigerated cooled glove box located in the uh, in the area you'd expect that to be. And it also has a very cool mini logo which projects out of the mirrors on the side. But apart from that, mini owners have been saying they wanted more space and uh, a bigger space inside the car. They got it in this vehicle, 1.5 liter uh, turbo three-cylinder, or if you go up to the S, you can get uh, a, a bigger engine, up to uh, 189 horsepower, eight-speed uh, shifter, automatic, um, an eight-speed, uh, and then a six-speed manual. I like the idea of the manual in this because they have got their gearbox down, I would say, almost perfectly in this vehicle. Some manuals I've driven in the past, remember, I haven't been driving as long as Brad's been driving, but some... some, some was Automatic? Like, What's an automatic? Yeah, exactly. Brad's used to horse... Horses pulling the... real horses. Yeah. Yes, with a uh, your your manual was how big your whip was, right? <laughs> That's right. So the six so the six the six speed manual is absolutely outstanding. Word on the street, we're going to get a uh, plug in hybrid version of this and an all wheel drive. Uh, twenty twenty five thirty five as far as fuel economy. But what does it compete with? Kind of confusing to what this car competes with. It's hard to find a uh, true competition. You have to kind of look at segments. Uh, the Golf is kind of a competitor. The Audi A4 wagon, kind of competitor. The Volvo V60 wagon, kind of a competitor. The the Fiat 500L, kind of a competitor. But none of those are real competitors with this car. It kind of stands on its own. There, uh, there is of course the uh, the Clubman, uh, the 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 Cooper and the S version. Um, this vehicle, I would say, is probably very cool. Uh, as far as tech is concerned, it has this sort of BMW who own Mini, their iDrive system, but a kind of, a better version of it on the inside. Like all of the Minis gone by, it still uses that center console space right in the middle to have to have its navigation screen in. It used to be where the the uh, the speedometer was. Now it has the navigation system there, and it uses the sort of the BMW uh, X Drive, uh, sorry, the iDrive system that the BMW have, uh, but it's the Mini version, which I, I kind of like it more. I was actually shocked because uh, I drove around with you at that one day and just how much I really love this car. Right. It, it's, I, I know it's a Mini and it's fun to drive, but it's just like some of the luxury features you're talking about is just, it's shocking. And there's tons of leg room in the back. Like I was sitting in the back with a guy that is twice my size and I had plenty, plenty of room. Plenty of room. That's, yeah. that's the one thing I hear from most people. Plenty of room in the back of this car. The Chesterfield uh, sofa style seats. You can also get the uh, Union flag embroidered on that. When I say Union flag, that's the correct word. You probably know it as Union Jack. But uh, it, it's only a Jack if it's on a ship. Uh, and you can get that also. It's going to be, they're going to have the, uh, the the Union flag on the roof of the, um, uh, the convertible as well. Uh, the thing I like most about this is from the key fob, you can press it and open those barn doors at the back. So they just open, they like spring-loaded barn doors, and uh, you can also wave your foot underneath as You're well. You're saying so. barn doors, not yeah. bond doors. Barn, B-A-R. Okay. 
I and thought I thought maybe they opened up and there was the a machine, machine gun in hit. the back that was shooting out. No. <laughs> Bond doors. <laughs> uh, so starting price, $24,000 and change. Go up to a high, you know, a low 30s uh, if, you, if you start to tick all the boxes. I think it's really reasonable. In fact, I'm absolutely considering getting one. I, I think the car fits me perfectly. Jen said it fits me perfectly. Right. So I think the car fits me perfectly. I've also been driving probably one of the most stable and staple uh, midsize sedans is the Kia Optima. Uh, it, this car, I would tell you, I probably recommended to more people uh, than, than any other midsize sedan. Here's the deal with the Kia Optima. Go look at the competition. Look at the price. Look at the 10-year, 10, 10 100,000-mile warranty. It's really hard to beat for what you get. And compare the options that you get on the Optima that come in at the base level that you're talking about versus the other vehicles and the add-on cost. Right. I mean, you're talking about uh, 1500 to $2,000 less than, than an optimal, you know, let's say a Honda Accord or a Toyota Camry. Look, I love those brands too, but this car to me speaks a lot more to my generation. I think it's a lot more sexy. I think it has a lot more of those buttons and dials and plugins that everybody wants in uh, in the XY generation, uh, up to 248 horsepower, six-speed automatic or a seven-speed dual clutch. Uh, it it's, it's, has trim levels everywhere from the very base car that you would just... Uh, get get all of the uh, the base stuff in right the way up to full luxury uh, high end leather. Isn't there high a plug in hybrid as well? Yeah, there's a, a hybrid. I don't think there's a plug in no, hybrid. No, there's no plug in. Yeah, that's right. Uh, front wheel drive, 29 miles a gallon is is the best you can get. It it has five different trim levels, so you can find everything. And the Uvo system, uh, I love the Kia's Uvo system, which is basically their infotainment system. You can use phone. Uh, you can you can track. You can have things like geofencing in it. Uh, it can give you service dates. Um, they've done a great job with that system as well. Uh, smartphone integration is great. Twenty one thousand nine hundred and ninety starts. You can get it up to about thirty six if you completely load the vehicle. All right, Sean. What have you been test driving this? I week? actually had a nice two door luxury coupe with the Lexus RCF, and I love this car. I wish. Lexus actually made every car look like this, feel like this, and performance, luxury, everything. It just, this embarrasses the rest of the luxury brand, or Lu Lexus brand. Right. I think the NX and the RX and the RCF are their three sort of new ideas of Lexus. And the, they've done really well. With the interior things. on this thing is so beautiful. The only thing I do not like about this car is on the interior is just the radio and the way it's set up. It looks a little 80s. And I wish they had updated because everything is so modern and touch everything. And it's just they have this old school radio that they had back in the 80s and that. But the performance on this vehicle is awesome. It is a five liter V8, 467 horsepower. 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds, 8-speed um, automatic, rear-wheel drive, gets 16 miles and 25 on the highway. Its competitors are the BMW M4 Coupe, Mercedes-Benz AMG C-Class, and the Audi RS5. And driving this vehicle is just fantastic. I took it up to the mountains. It hugs the corners. It's a nice sports car, and it has this beautiful luxury look to it. There's spindle grill. I, I I can't complain. You can get into it for sixty two thousand dollars and I can complain about that. Well, but what you're talking a five hundred almost five hundred horsepower right. vehicle, you're not getting in too many cars under that. I mean, other than maybe a scat pack. Right. So Which I'm not sure that really competes with anyway. Yeah, but I I just it's a great vehicle and a great styling. I wish they put more of the styling cues into this car into the other Lexus brand. No, I said I it like it, doing. I said it a year ago. I think Lexus are kicking backside, and I think they're going to make some big changes. And I think Toyota too. I think they they realized that you know they canceled the Scion brand this week. Uh, we all kind of knew that was coming. They had sold 170 thousand vehicles in 2006. Last year it was just down to 60 thousand vehicles, and 58 something and change. I, I, we all saw that coming with Scion, and I think uh, Toyota kind of got real all of a sudden. Well, they need to. They need to have some fun with their brands. I mean, no offense to them. They are a safe, reliable brand, and that's kind of been their whole MO for how long. And this vehicle actually is total opposite of it. It's fun to drive, and, I mean, obviously you're getting the reliability of owning a Lexus. So right, absolutely. How can you lose? And what was the price again? $64,885. Brad, tell me you haven't got something so painful. 
No, I have the 2016 car of the year that I got to drive was the new Civic. Okay. Little controversial for me because that wasn't going to be my choice for car of the year. However, the uh, this is Honda's longest running nameplate, largest selling model globally. They've sold 22 million cars globally. 75% of the Civic sold since 1991 are still on the road. So that is the huge drawing card for this is that they last forever and people like the car. And for 2016, they kind of went off the grid a little bit. Honda's been very safe. They've gone with what they call the dynamic rejuvenation. And led by the Accord and the Pilot, you kind of see the precursors to the dramatic changes that you're going to see in the styling for this car. Right. It's dramatic. And some people love it. Some people hate it. I was Sales are up 47% of yeah, Civic. So somebody it, likes it. A lot of people really like it. So their goal was to lead the class in the C-class segment, that compact class, but then compete you know, rival with some of the luxury compacts. So they have two new engines, the 2.0 liter and then the 1.5 turbo, both average about 35 miles per gallon overall. That's what I've heard the best about this car is the engines. Haven't driven it yet, but I've heard the it's, best. It's weird. It, uh, talk to Sean about it. Looks sporty, looks everything else. It just didn't fit my eye when I was inside. And people loved it, and I assumed I had to love it. And maybe it was because of anticipation and I expected so much more for the car and then when yeah, I got in you know, it you know one of the things I would tell you and a counter argument to that is this is aimed at an audience that's about 80 years younger than you good point I like it's aimed for my sons yes of it. I mean it does have some nice styling cues on the outside the brake lights are this nice v-shape angled and really aggressive look and I, I think like, one of the nice features is that you can get in a base car that drives really well with the manual for under nineteen thousand dollars, right? So that is a heck of a buy for a really stylish, nice, compact sedan that gets great gas mileage. You know what blows me away when you look at this car next to the Civics of the seventies? I did with my mother-in-law's car. <laughs> it's about <laughs> twice the size. It is. It is no longer a compact sedan. <laughs> so I mean, it is, but you wouldn't buy it. It's not a Brad car. I I tend to prefer like the Mazda three. That is just more to my eye and more to my liking. Okay. But still great. I mean, great car, great value, and you know it'll last forever. All right. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, spending some time in, in that Civic. Uh, coming up, we're going to be talking about Cadillac, and we're going to find out all about how the company has revolutionized what they're doing as far as luxury cars are concerned. The new CT6, Bill Mack from Cadillac, is going to be uh, on the phone telling us how that brand has changed. You're listening to Test Miles, FM News 101 KXL. I'm Nick Miles. FM News 101. Staying connected with the automotive world, you're listening to Portland's number one car show. Test Miles on radio, on television, online, and on your mobile. Thanks for you helping us head into our third year. It's all about you guys. Fun fact for today, all cars had to be cranked until Cadillac introduced the first electric starter in 1912 on the Model 30. Thank God. I was waiting for that forever. <laughs> Brad, you got, in there before I, it you. you got in there before I could. Cadillac <laughs> is the fastest growing luxury brand in China. They are undergoing somewhat of a new American revolution. They moved from Detroit to New York, a town where they feel they fit a lot more. And the brand historically has been quite outstanding. Cadillac is amongst the oldest automobile, automobile brands in the world, second in America only to its fellow GM marquee Buick. Uh, it was at the forefront of technology. Advances include in the Cadillac full electric ver versions of their cars uh, as far as on the interior, lights and switches and that sort of thing. The, uh, the crashless manual transmission and the steel roof, they all came from Cadillac. The brand also developed the V8 engine, which became standard for the American automobile industry. A uh, hundred years ago, they were revolutionizing the auto industry, and they appear to be doing the same again with their new CT6, the company's new flagship, to answer our questions about the car and the company. Bill Mack from Cadillac, the global project manager, is joining us on the phone. Bill, uh, what has the reaction been around the world so far to the new CT6? Hey, uh, hello. Thanks, and good morning. Uh, the reaction really has been has been great. I think it's really been a testament to what we've done with the car, kind of a new formula that we're really trying to work for the luxury segment. And honestly, uh, we've been pleased by the messages that have been coming back from the press. They've been pretty much what we felt the car is, and that they've given it a very good shot. And so we couldn't be happier about the initial reaction. 
So let's talk about this move to uh, Cadillac moving to New York. Uh, is, is that really where the company is going at this new image? Because, of course, Detroit was always seen as the home of the, of the automobile industry, but New York's kind of a better fit for the Cadillac brand. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's a great fit for the brand. So when you take all of our marketing and all of, all of that staff and you move them to New York, they're really in the hub of luxury. They live luxury. They're immersed in luxury. Um, and it's also a very global city, so it's an ideal place for our marketers to be housed. We also have a very dedicated group um, in Detroit still that work on products, people like myself who work with, very closely with engineering and vehicle teams to uh, define the vehicle. So I honestly think it's the, the best of both worlds. Let's talk about the CT6. What, what's the competition for this car? When you look at it, and kind of why we sort of talk about it as a new formula, we really think our, our competition, let's look at the size of the car. So it's bigger than what the mid-sized luxury market would be. And that mid-sized luxury market is typically like a BMW 5 Series or a Mercedes E-Class. So it's much bigger than those cars. It's slightly smaller than a 7 uh, Series or an S-Class. So it fits nicely in that spot. We think it's a, a, a great size. We talked to a lot of customers that weren't getting enough um, rear excuse me, seat room in the mid lux segment and didn't quite have the budget to move fully up into the large luxury segment. So that's where we are, and that's kind of where we see our competition um, happening. It's not really constructed like any, any other vehicle, though, is it? You guys invented a whole bunch of new technologies to fit into making this car. Yeah, and, and I think the construction story is a really good one for this car, and it gives us some great benefits. So we really had to come up with three new joining techniques to allow us to put the car together. No other car has been put together like this. We join... 11 different materials, and the materials earned themselves into the car by saying, okay, here's the function we needed to do, here's how strong we needed to be, but here's how light it should be, so what material fits that role? So we found some cases, like with steel around the passenger compartment, makes the passenger uh, compartment quieter and safer, that that was the best material for there, and aluminum was the best for almost everywhere else. But nobody had ever joined steel and aluminum before, and nobody has joined aluminum like we're joining it now. So 11 materials, three patented joining processes really come together for a car that's, that's you know, around 1,000 pounds lighter than an S-Class and about 200 pounds lighter than, than the much smaller um, 5 Series or E-Class. All right. So what about the tech? Great construction, but are you guys uh, matching the rest of the market as far as tech is concerned in the vehicle? Yeah, I think we are, and I think in some cases we're, we're doing some things differently there. Uh, we're introducing a rear camera mirror, which uses its own dedicated high-definition video camera to display in the rear-view mirror. It gives you about a 300% increase um, in your mirror width. And also, when you have people in the car, um, you don't see those people because you're looking through the video camera. Right. And that's a great new piece of technology. I think really on a, on a four-lane highway, you're getting a great view back there. You have great situational awareness. You see the cars around you. A really right. big safety feature. Bill, we're running out of time here, but I will tell you, I absolutely love the car when I drove it in Southern California. Well done, Cadillac. I think you've really got a winner on your hands. You're listening to Test Miles, FM News 101, KXL. I'm Nick Miles. and coast in with testmiles.com. Keeping you connected to the automotive world, you're listening to Test Miles on radio, on television, online, and on your mobile. This is America's Car Radio Show. Find us on Twitter at Test Miles. Another fun fact today, the first backup camera was introduced in 1956 on a Buick Centurion car at the General Motors Motorama. Excellent. And again, Brad was right there. According to a report by Juniper Research, 20% of all consumer cars in the West, in Western Europe and North America will be connected by 2017. Uh, that's reaching 90 million vehicles. Andy Colley is a director of communications at AT&T. Uh, Andy, is AT&T uh, at the front of this revolution of mobile communications? Oh, you bet, Nick. Um, actually, AT&T added... One million cars in one quarter last year. You know, that was that counting for more customer additions than any other category. So you think about that for a minute. I mean, that's more than postpaid and prepaid phones. That's more than tablet PCs or satellite TV. So it's definitely an area that the company is uh, aggressive in and pushing connected cars. So more Americans are using mobile services. Is this becoming the new area of expansion for communications companies? 
Oh, well, it certainly is for, for us. Um, when we look at the fact that, uh, I guess, what you call the Internet of Things, or that means connected devices, so that can include cars, homes, wearables, um, for AT&T, yeah, it, it's definitely um, a wave of the future. I mean, right now, roughly half of the connected cars in the U.S. Um, are connected by AT&T, and we have deals with 10 automakers. I mean, that's you know, Volvo, Ford, GM, Subaru, BMW, you name it. So it is a wave of the future. Now, uh, we got to spend some time together at the uh, Portland International Auto Show last week. You showed me some cool products. What, what are AT&T offering to consumers? Well, in addition to uh, the deals with uh, auto manufacturers themselves, there's also aftermarket options. Obviously, aftermarket automotive products, huge uh, industry. And, you know, there are people who are happy with their current vehicle. And the good thing is, is that they can get connected car features and benefits as well. Uh, thanks to products like the ZTE Mobile, which turns your car into a Wi-Fi hotspot, or the Car Connection 2.0 device, which gives you diagnostics remotely through an app on your cell phone. So the aftermarket products are getting really big, too. Uh, I love the idea that this uh, you have products that plug directly into the, uh, the carport in the car, which would, mechanics would normally use to diagnose problems with the vehicle. That's right. Uh, in one of those, I was mentioning the ZTE Mobley. It's important to mention, you know, you opened the segment with some research. We actually did some research as well, along with Ericsson, a study of connected car buyers. And we found that nearly 80% of car buyers globally would actually delay their new car purchase by one year to get those connected features. And the Wi-Fi hotspot ranked as the number one feature that U.S. customers are willing to purchase for their car. So if you think about it, that's the number one, and there's these aftermarket products like the ZT Mobley, which plug into the diagnostic port, it makes it available to everyone. All right, Andy, we've got some good products. I know that we talked about at the show. I'm looking forward. I know we're going to uh, be testing those. Uh, so how do we find out about the stuff that, uh, that AT, uh, AT&T has to offer? Actually, it's all on our website. And those two products I mentioned, they're available at all AT&T retail stores. So, um, the, yeah, so information is definitely out there online. Um, our retail representatives in the store know about those aftermarket products. Um, so come on in, and we're happy to talk to you about them. All right, and we'll let you know uh, how they do uh, if, we, if we get a chance to test them. I know that Andy has said that uh, we'll, we'll get a chance to test those on the show. Uh, Andy Colley from AT&T, thank you so much. All right, we've also been testing some other products for vehicles uh, around uh, detailing, and Ryan is here. Uh, Ryan, you've, uh, you're kind of going to be our in-house tester. Uh, your company is called Afterglow. You do detailing for a lot of big car companies. What have you been testing this week? Well, this week we've been testing out the Black Shine Trimmer Store brought to you by Griot's Garage, which is based out of Tacoma, Washington. We tried it on two different cars, a 2016 Toyota and a 2008 Dodge Ram. All right, how did it do? That's right. they got to kill the phone line in the other room. Sorry about that. <laughs> how so, did it do? As for protection, it worked out really well. We've only tested it for three days so far, but normal road travel for two days with rain and dirt, it has stayed very well protected just with some water. What's the idea of the product? So what, what does it do? So it's a water-soluble restorer. So basically you have to clean your plastic first. It's not going to clean it for you, but it's going to restore that shine, and it bonds silica or silicon and water together, and it just basically repels water off of anything. So this is the old the plastic around the wheel wells, the mumper, that's something you have a black plastic mumper. Any kind of black What do plastic. you normally use for that? So normally I just use a wheel dressing, which is water soluble as well, and you put it just or on your tires, and it repels the water straight off your tires and keeps them clean. And I normally put that straight on the plastics; works out fine. All right. Would you use this instead? I would definitely use this instead. All right. Remind, all remind us what it's called again. It is Griot's Garage Black Shine Trimmer Store. All right. Uh, that, and of course, in the future, you've got a bunch of other stuff. Uh, uh, Meguiar's are going to send us some products. You found some local companies, too, that make products in Portland. Yes, we have Auto Solutions, which we're supporting right now, and they are endorsing us to start using a couple of their products. And what, what, what do they make? I've never heard of Auto Solutions before. Is this like a, a local company that specifically makes detailing product? They are actually a part of a national brand that makes and manufactures their own products on site and sells them to anywhere from consumers to detailers like me. So 
anyone can get a hold of this. There's a big, there's a big aftermarket. I mean, I know Turtle Wax and Maguire's and those guys have owned this market for a long time, but there's there's a lot of new products uh, coming up in the market, isn't there? A lot of and and these make at home mix products too. I keep seeing a lot of those. Definitely. Well, when you go to the store, you have your consumer products, which are basically basically your grocery store chemicals, and then you have your professional quality chemicals that are made. All right. And so where would you buy professional quality car detailing? Because I don't want to put, you know, I want the best for my car. Exactly. I mean, if you're local, I'd definitely check out Auto Solutions. If not, I check out anywhere online from Detail King, Auto Geek, anything like that. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, And if you, uh, of course, want your car detailing, Afterglow would be happy to talk to you about that. Uh, When we come back, Jeff Zerschmied is going to be here from the Oregonian and Chief Executive Editor-in-Chief with a big hat at testmiles.com. We went ice driving in Colorado together, and it was cold. We'll tell you all about that. It's coming up on Test Miles. I'm Nick Miles. Like NASCAR, but with one right turn. Testmiles.com. All right, I have a retraction on Test Miles here. Just wait for it for a second. They're live from our studios in downtown Portland on a Sunday morning, Super Bowl Sunday. This is America's Car Radio Show. We'd like to thank you for being part of the Car Nation. For more fun facts about cars, go to our Facebook page, Test Miles ENT. Last fun fact, the first car produced at General Motors facility in Arlington, Texas, was a 1954 four-door black Pontiac Chieftain. Are you sure? Yes. Because I'm saying John Vincent from the Portland Tribune will make sure. We have an incorrect <laughs> fact we need to withdraw this morning because um, John John Vincent, my dear friend, uh, who who is very good at making sure that I don't make mistakes, didn't catch this one for me. However, uh, we did say Cadillac was the second oldest name plate in, in North America. It is clearly not. Ford and Oldsmobile are much older, although Oldsmobile doesn't technically exist anymore. And, and John did point that out. So thank you, John. Uh, and um, I think John should come in and proofread my scripts because I make lots of mistakes and he's not here to, to help me out. Jeff Zerschmied is here from the Oregonian this week. Uh, Jeff also man- is the managing editor of uh, testmiles.com. Uh, Jeff, what's uh, what's new? Uh, what's going on? What have you, You've been to the Nissan Sentra launch, right? Yeah, yeah. I went and uh, went down to California and drove the, uh, the updated Nissan Sentra. Uh, it's still fundamentally the same car that they introduced in 2013, but they've given it a major facelift for 2016. Um, a few things on the outside, new grill and things like that. But the real important thing that they've done is they have just dra- dramatically improved the suspension and the uh, and the interior quiet level. It is much, much quieter than it used to be. And in that class of, of compact economy cars now, I think probably one of the quietest, if not the quietest inside. Is it going to have the backbone to compete with things like the Civic and, and those other cars, the, the Toyota the, in, in that class? Well, it already does. Uh, the Nissan is typically third after Honda and Toyota in terms of, of overall sales. So the Sentra is hugely popular. The Sentra has been around since 1982, I think, is when that, that name badge was Wait, first Wait, Sean, in. were you born then? Yeah, John, I wasn't in the, in the 70s, <laughs> so get your facts checked. <laughs> yeah. We also got an email about that one. Uh, <laughs> the Sentra's been a consistent favorite right. for so, you know, over 30 years. So this is yeah. bounce between Sentra and, and this is bounce between Toyota and Honda for this uh, this C segment here. The, you know, the Civic was the number one selling car for many mm-hmm. years. Toyota comes up there with the Corolla. They lose out to, you know, they, they beat the Civic. Uh, mm-hmm. They've dominated in that in this for the last two or three years. New Civic, 47 for sale cent in growth for the, the Civic brand. Mm-hmm. Uh, over year over year, so we see it coming back. Does the Sentra have any look into second place, or is it still just between those two companies? I don't see them coming up into second place. I mean, that there's just so it's so big of a hill to climb to compete with Honda and Toyota. But um, you know, I see them as a, a solid third. Um, you know, and if anything, Nissan needs to be looking over its shoulder as Kia comes on and Hyundai come on with uh, high-quality products of their own. Yeah, I, I'm hearing stories about the Elantra, and I know Kia's going to produce the Forte in Mexico. There'll be a new Forte. We were expecting mm-hmm. it at the LA show, never appeared, so we, we're hoping going to see it at New York, uh, new Kia Forte, and it's going to be highly competitive with that. Yeah, and, th- and that market segment, the compact economy cars, is just brutal for, for competition on price and on features. I've been to Montreal. 
I have been to Iceland, but I did not suffer the temperatures that we had in Colorado <laughs> last week when Jeff and I were in Gunston, Colorado. True. It was minus, can't count that high. Well, minus, the fact that you made it was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, as well. I, yeah. they, I have a now a, United are my least favorite airline in the whole world now. Cause well, they, you and me both, brother. They, they made <laughs> me suffer horribly uh, getting out there. But the let, let's just talk about this event. A uh, Mazda take a field which is covered in snow and ice and make a racetrack mm-hmm. out of it and to demonstrate how well their four-wheel drive vehicles do, but they, they threw in an event of driving Miatas, uh, MX-5s, on the ice, which was, let's be honest, why we were all there. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, that was the that was the, the real hook and the real treat for us was uh, getting fully slideways in a, uh, in a Miata on the snow. Uh, they gave us plenty of room, so we didn't hit anything. Uh, but uh, it was great fun to drive and uh, just out there hot-dogging it. And uh, I think, didn't you post the video of you and me both yes. doing that to the Test Miles Facebook page? Yes, it's on. If you go to Test Miles Facebook page, you can see the video of us doing it. We, we had a lot. Of, you know, it was one of those events where I should have posted about a thousand more pictures and videos than I actually did, but I was having way too much fun to do it. What, the, the one thing I did like about the video, you guys had the top down. Yes. Of course. I absolutely that I loved, and that's, that's pride. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we absolutely insisted on having the top down. But this event actually created quite a bit of controversy because there was quite a bit of tittle-tattling going on between, and when, when I say a, a, tittle-tattling is the wrong word, I, I think sort of sparring maybe a better word between mm-hmm. Subaru and Mazda on the internet because uh, Mazda found a couple of weaknesses in some of the Subaru cars which they exploited in the event. Yeah, and and it's important to recognize that the tests that, that Mazda engineered were highly specific. You know, they had to, you had to turn the wheels at a particular angle and, and, uh, and be on a particular size of a hill and everything else. So in, in a way, it wasn't fair to, to the Subaru in terms of overall performance. And but no, no, less there, people there, think, I would tell you there were some other events there where we got to test them. Yeah, you know, in in other events where and they put the same tires on the car. I mean, they they tried mm-hmm. hard overall. And 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 look, the the Subarus did really well. The the Honda CR uh, CRV did did fairly well. Mm-hmm. But in in the other like the slalom tests and those type of things, I really noticed the difference uh, in driving those vehicles. Subaru did well, but it's a heavier, it's an older mm-hmm. vehicle, those type of things. So I think the hill climb event that we're talking about, which was where you had to go up a hill, mm-hmm. you had to stop on the hill and turn your wheels. Uh, Mazda already knew that Subarus uh, disconnected their all wheel drive system when you turn the wheels and the vehicle wouldn't have been able to pull off the hill. So that was weighted. Well, mine pulled off, when I was driving, the uh, Subaru pulled off the hill as well as the Mazda. Um, but lest people think we were just screwing around in Colorado, we, we were doing some serious work. We did compare many different vehicles um, in road tests and in slalom tests on the snow. And uh, I thought the Subaru acquitted itself very well and uh, and and... The, no shame there. I did. I did offer Michael McHale from Subaru the opportunity to let us retest all the vehicles. We, you know, when he he puts the test together. Well, but Sean he, and I would he, love to test a Subaru at some point over uh, the next decade. <laughs> you mean you haven't had test cars? That's oh my, dear. You guys had some pretty good tires though, too, didn't you? Yeah, we did. There. Blizzex tires were were great from uh, Bridgestone. Yeah, they uh, they gave us the chance to test um, a two wheel drive Mazda CX three and then a four wheel drive Mazda CX three on all season tires, and then the four wheel drive a Mazda CX three on Blizzax. And the apples to apples comparison is between the two all wheel drive cars with the all season tires and the um, and the Blizzax. And there it was night and day. You know your your ability to get going, your ability to turn, and your ability to stop, especially was dramatically improved on the Blizz Axe. I learned something very important. When we go we went from a two-wheel drive Mazda to a four-wheel drive Mazda, it's really important to have winter tires on the vehicle. And the reason yeah. is the weight differential between the two was so dramatic that the car can't stop in the distance it can as a uh, the two-wheel drive. Yeah. And, and and so you end up with a car that slid, you know, 150 feet or so in the snow because of that, on the ice, because of that problem. Yeah, I mean, I was really impressed with the ability of the two-wheel drive car to make it at all. 
through the system, and it did. So the two-wheel drives are really good, but the all-wheel drive cars, um, you know, all-wheel drive helps you get going, it helps you turn, but it doesn't help you stop. Yeah, when you apply the brakes, it's just another car. I tell people that all the time. What do we look forward to on test miles over the next couple of weeks? We'll have a detailed write-up of the Nissan Sentra and a complete recap of our time in Colorado, and I'll be at the Chicago Auto Show later this week. Absolutely, and John Vincent, from there. by the way, you need to join us in Chicago if you're coming. Uh, we'll, we'll do the radio show from Chicago. Uh, Test Miles, it's here 24-7 at testmiles.com. You can see me on Coin6 throughout the week with my reports on vehicles. And I will be back here again with a whole team, Brad, Sean, Jen, and uh, also our test crew next week on Test Miles. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Until then, drive safely, my friends. Favorite us, tweet us, friend us, love us, all at testmiles.com.